My special guest today is top physiotherapist, strength conditioning coach to so many athletes as well as rock stars and movie stars, Mr. Dave Hancock. Dave, welcome to the show. Thanks, Joey. Thanks for having me. Uh, you're over in Florida today, yeah? I am. Uh, I'm actually down in West Palm Beach doing some work with a couple of uh, golfers prior to the Masters. So, uh, yeah, just uh, trying to enjoy a bit of sun, but so, still sorry. working, still working, brother. I know, you're a busy man, you're a busy man. So when did you decide you wanted a career in physiotherapy? So uh, I got injured. I played rugby at a pretty good level, got injured when I was about 15, went to see a physio, and I was always very athletic and very sporty as a kid played rugby and used to run and uh, I was like this is brilliant you know you, I, I'm a very giving caring type of guy always have been and I was like I want to do something in sport and this was it so from the age of sort of 15 16 I then went to the military base down in the south called Headley Court which looked after all of the military it was an RAF rehabilitation center and that's where the physio at the club worked and I had a work experience there I think when I was 16 and then that was it. I was hooked. So I needed to go to medical school in Leeds. Had some good training at the college at Penderfields College, which is obviously no longer there now, unfortunately. Um, and sort of then that was sort of my path to do what I've been doing for the last 27 years. Well, so you worked in uh, 17 years in English football with many clubs, which included Chelsea and the England international team. When did you start out in English football? So I started with Wolves in 1994 uh, with Graham Taylor. He was my first manager. And then I was at Wolves from 94 to 98. And then I went with the club secretary and the assistant manager, Bobby Downs, went to Blackburn Rovers to set up their youth academy. So designed their training facility and got involved in the development of youth athletes. And then in 2000, got asked again to go to Leeds United when they were sort of flying high semi-finals Champions League, was able to design their training facility and implement some of my sort of ideas and philosophies at quite a young age. And uh, was there through the good times and the bad. And I, I obviously trained and lived up in the north and, and obviously loved Leeds United and loved Leeds, the city, um, which was great for me. And then I got offered to go to Chelsea uh, in 2006, I think, with Jose Mourinho. And the offer was really too good to turn down. I think Leeds were in the championship at the time. Right. And was fortunate enough then to win a few trophies with Chelsea and the likes, yeah. What was it like working with Jose? A special well, one. I, I learned a lot from Jose. I learned a lot from him. The guy is a winner. Mm. Uh, he knows what he wants, whether you agree or disagree with him. But I had the utmost respect for the man. I still talk to him to this day. Um, di difficult to work with at times, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's about winning. And uh, that's one thing that that team at that time did. So, uh, you know, I'm very grateful to be a part of something that, that, you know, was a winning formula and enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's still one of football's characters, isn't he, to this day? He's been around, <laughs> he's been around the block, you know. He's been with everybody. He's won so much. Um I recently watched a documentary on him with Tottenham, actually. Uh, it was on Prime last year, and it was quite entertaining. Uh, yeah. There was a part where the, the, the team, had, um, they looked terrified in the dressing room. He said, I'm not, mad, I'm not mad with you guys. He said, my dog just died, and it's Christmas Eve. <laughs> <laughs> the, doc <laughs> the documentary. <laughs> yeah, and he's, the players are all looking at him, you know. But, uh, but you were with Chelsea. Uh, I'm going to mention this. I've got to mention this one, David. You were with Chelsea, uh, that famous Champions League semi-final against us at Anfield. And you've talked to me about this before, but you, you were saying about the atmosphere, and that was the year we went on to Istanbul, uh, the Gerard final, we call it, you know. But um, what was that like that night? I, so I remember there was two, the, w there was the year that I think it was the quarterfinals, and the atmosphere and the cop was just bouncing. Mm. And I think of all the. 17 odd years of going to various different stadiums from the Benabal to the new camp to Turkey to all these, you know, incredible stadiums and environments. I had never experienced anything like that. Uh, so that was that quarterfinal where Liverpool ended up winning and going through. And then that following year, we came back and we had, Anf I think we played Anfield in the second leg when you went through to the final. Yeah. And then it reversed in the, in the, in the, the following year 
where we had you in the quarterfinals or the semifinals, I can't remember, it's a while ago. That was 2008 where we went to the Champions League final, played Manchester United in the final. And we came back and we had you in the first leg. But I just remember that semi-final atmosphere uh, and you never walk alone. I just had hairs on the back of my neck, you know, and I, and obviously, you know, I've looked after many of the Liverpool players from Fowler to Matteo yeah. um, to Paul Stewart, believe it or not. Yeah. Um, I'd never experienced anything like that. And that, that atmosphere for me will live with me for the rest of my life. I mean, that is something special. You know, the Liverpool fans are very, very special people. And, you know, that that togetherness before the game and the atmosphere was just incredible. There's a lot of passion there from when you can walk back home, you know, it's Liverpool you know, yeah. or Everton, you know, it, it goes whichever team you support, but it really is the city. Sure. It's like such a passionate city for football. So how, how many years were you with Chelsea? Uh, about two and a half. And then I went to the New York Knicks. I got poached to go to the Knicks. That's uh, what I was going to talk to you about when you when there. you actually moved to the USA, yeah? Yeah. Because I, I want to talk about the night I met you. Uh, it was here in San Antonio. <laughs> um, I remember I was going to a gig. I was going to a gig. And it's not there anymore. It's changed called Swig Wine Bar. And I used to live in an apartment across the street from it. And I'm actually walking a five, ten second walk to the gig. And this car stops. This guy shouts, hey, man, I'm looking for the Valencia Hotel. There's a, do you see a bar in there? I said, yeah, if you just go two blocks up, turn left, go straight along um, Houston Street. And it turned out, I later found out it was Malik Rose, the former That's right. San Antonio Spurs player who was shouting me. Malik Rose, yeah. And then after I told him directions, I just seen all the windows in the back of that car going down and all these Cockney accents going Scout, sir, calm down, calm down. I'm like, who are these fellas? And that's the night I met you. And you said, what are you doing here? I said, I'm doing a gig over there. And you said, yeah, we'll be over there like you. And you all did. You all came over. And it was the night before you played uh, the Spurs, wasn't it? And uh, That's right. Next that's day, right. I took you around the Alamo. The next day, we went for a coffee. You no? Do you remember that? You did, yeah. yeah so that, that, was, was, uh, that must have been probably nearly close to over 10 years ago. It's got to be easier, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and I thank you for that Liverpool shirt you got me. I still got that, obviously. Uh, you got signed. You got got a sign for me. Um, now, also, okay, you you were with the New York Knicks for how long? Uh, just under seven years okay. as a performance director. All right. Now I know you're a huge music fan. And you've chosen some tracks to play today, which will lead into some great stories you have. You've got a great uh, Dave Grohl story. Uh, I have indeed. For uh... One of the nicest, uh, most genuine human beings I've actually had the pleasure to meet and to treat. Um, and just an all round great guy and someone who, in all honesty, uh, hasn't probably changed because of fame, which is in this modern day and age is actually really difficult. Uh, just uh, like my top two, three people that I've had been fortunate enough to work with and uh, look after and just become good friends. I actually uh, he invited me and my wife to his 50th birthday party and we uh, had a blast. That's another story probably he'll tell you that I had too much of a blast, but <laughs> <laughs> we won't talk about that. Um, so, yeah, we, we basically, if, it's obviously common knowledge that Dave fell off stage in Sweden and broke his ankle. And then they're in the middle of the two fighters world, uh, Foo Fighters World uh, Tour. And at the time, uh, obviously moving out of sport, as you know, I've moved sort of into entertainment and other uh, genres. And I was actually on tour looking after the U2 boys. So the surgeon that did the uh, repair his ankle, I worked with at Chelsea, uh, brilliant uh, surgeon, Dr. James Calder. And um, they, they got a call through to the management at U2 and said, listen, Dave's done his ankle. We need someone to look after him on tour. Can you help? And I said, yeah, I can send one of my guys. And uh, we ended up then looking after Dave. So um, he's in a plaster. He's had the surgery. He's on tour. He's on his, on his uh, throne doing his stuff. And uh, they come to the U2 gig in New York. So um, they said, will you go and see Dave? And I just talk him through, you know, what's in, ahead of him, because obviously he's never broken a bone in his body and never really gone through rehabilitation of a major injury. Right. And I said, yeah, sure. So I went and met him and the band were there in the green room and uh, his mum was there. And I said to him, I said, I was telling him about what he needs to do. And he's like, great. I said, look, we, we take great care of you. This is what we do. We know what we're doing. We all come from sport, blah, blah, blah. And I then I said to him, I said, uh, I actually have met you once before. And he said to me, 
really? Where? So when I was at Chelsea, the a good friend of mine is Chris Moyle, was the DJ for Radio One at the yeah. time, the breakfast show. And I met Chris years ago when I was at Leeds, and we just become really good friends over the years. And uh, I'm a big Foo Fighters fan, and uh, I just think Dave and the band, and all Pat and Taylor and all those are like fantastic group, right? They produce fantastic music. And um, he said to me, Radio One's doing a recording of the Foo Fighters. Do you want to come down? He said, there'd be 200 people, private, down in Brighton. Come down. So me and my wife, I said, are you kidding me? He said, no. He said, come down. I said, oh, my God, this is dream come true. You know, it's like watching the Foo's play in your front living room. Yeah. So I went down. It was unbelievable. They played about seven tracks. And then afterwards, Chris said, right, all my breakfast team, we're going to go for a couple of beers, and then we're going to go for a curry. And obviously, Chris had a security guard because he's working for BBC Radio 1 and he was obviously very popular TV shows and this and the other in the UK. So we sat outside of Brighton looking over the, the, the pier and we sat on the, on the, at the front of the pub. On the, on the, on the, there was like a, a bar outside area. And we're just sitting there having a beer and then we're going to go for this curry. And all of a sudden, out in the middle of nowhere, this bloke with a hoodie on runs out going, hey, Chris Miles! <laughs> And wraps his arms around this Chris Moyles, right? So next thing, security guard doing his job, gets hold of this bloke, throws him across these tables, smashes glasses, pins him to the floor, and it's Dave Grohl. Well, <laughs> every, every, all the Radio 1 team are going, oh, my God, are you okay? Are you okay? Of course, I've just pissed myself. I just started laughing my yeah. head off. And the security guard's obviously gone, oh, oh, oh I'm really sorry. And by the way, Asa, if you're listening, then, uh, you know, <laughs> the, the cat's out of the bag because uh, it was one of the funniest moments I have. And what was even funnier about it was that Dave just went out for a walk with his mum and his mum was stood on the pavement watching this security guard attack her son and pin him to the floor. Dave Gold's mum. <laughs> yeah. So, of course, then you, you now fast forward probably 10 years. I'm talking to him about looking after his ankle. And I said to him, do you remember that incident in Brighton? And he looked at me and he went, were you there? And I went, <laughs> yeah, I was there. And he went, mum, mum, he was at that incident where that security guard got me and put it across. And what's <laughs> even funnier about the whole thing, right, was that that security guard, right, yep. ended up being the security guard for Daniel Craig. And I ended up working with Daniel on the Bond movie. And I was in the back of a car once in Mexico City for Spectre. And I said to Dan, I said, oh, Dan, has uh, Asa ever told you the story about Dave Grohl? <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable the separation of you yeah. know, life and where it takes you. But he is, without a shadow of a doubt, one of the nicest, most genuine people. I remember I, I was in, in L.A. and I was just there to do the rehab with him. And he said to me, so what are you doing tomorrow night? I said, yeah, no. He said, you want to go to a party? And I'm thinking, my God, well, they were in LA now, right? Yeah. So um, we're going to a Stella McCartney um, fashion show, like a release of the latest gear, right? Mm -hmm. And he said it's at this old uh, record store. I think it's called Amoeba Records or something like that in LA. Very famous vinyl store in LA. Yeah, there's record store. It's pretty cool. Anyway, I'm super excited. I'm thinking, my God, I'm going to go out for a few beers with Dave Grohl. Brilliant. Absolute class. This fashion thing, blah, blah. And uh, my Uber didn't turn up. So I'm texting him going, oh, look, I'm going to be late. And he went, no, 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 I'll wait for you. And I'm like, no, 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 I see you. You go in, just put my name down. I'll, I'll meet you in there. He said, no, no, I'll wait. Really? So I turned up. Yeah, this is the guy. <laughs> Honestly, this is the most genuine. It's like one of your mates. <laughs> and literally, there's a red carpet. There's paps everywhere. I mean, it's a big event. And I'm thinking, and I've texted him. I'm like, where are you? Have you gone in? And he's around the corner waiting for me. Now, what Rockstar does, something like that. Well, I mean, yeah. that is just absolute class. Okay. So uh, one of my very fortunate, uh, you know, I've been very lucky, mm. but without a shadow of a doubt, one of the nicest guys and most genuine people yeah. that I've ever, and very funny, yeah. very, very funny. Loves a laugh, loves a crack. My sort of guy. And just uh, as a musician, just absolute genius. You work with Daniel Craig when he was making the Spectre movie? I did, yeah. I was, uh, I was lucky. Uh, I, I worked with uh, Simon Watson, his trainer, um, helped him out and become again just through working in for sport and at Chelsea. 
and then uh, I got a phone call um, to see if I would come and help. Um, Dan got injured, and then uh, the rest is, you know, history. Is like you 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 move in one circle, and then yeah. just very lucky, Joey, to be honest with you, mate. And just I look back at my career, and just very fortunate to, you know, move from one person to another, and obviously move from sport to music to film. Um, well, but the big yeah. common denominator that I sort of see with a lot of these people, right, is that w- what the average Joe doesn't realise is how much work and dedication these people put into their craft, right? And yep. to be at the very, very, very top of their game, you know, they are fully committed. You know, I I, I was blown away the fact that, you know, Dan would do a 14-hour day, six days a week on set for like five, six months. You know, it's like ridiculous. I mean, it's just, I just thought they'd turn up, do three or four hours and there you go. There, there's a wrap and then move on to the next day. It's like intense, you know, it's 6 a.m. start sometime. They go over on the shoots. I mean, you're on location, you know, there's a whole host of, you know, it's a big machine, but very, very privileged and honoured. Um, and again, it's just a lovely, lovely human being, just a great guy. Um, not really into fame and stardom. Um very talented. I saw him do a fellow once in New York and I was just blown away by what, you know, the craft of this guy can act. Yeah. So not just being a, you know, 007, but, you know, playing an Othello and doing Shakespeare. Um, yeah, really, really brilliant to in- see this insights about how different people in different industries are top and the reason that they're top of their game. It's great, isn't it? I mean, what a journey you've had and are still having, you know, from uh, <laughs> 17 years of English football, New York Knicks, working with rock stars, movie stars, and also you continue to work with athletes too. I know NFL star Odell Be- uh, Beckham Jr. for one. You worked with yeah. him too, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to ask you now, how did you come to work with Sir Paul McCartney? So uh, that was really through Stella, uh, through his daughter, and uh, there's mm-hmm. obviously a connection through um, Dave Grohl and through his wife nancy and uh again just a gentleman i mean an absolute gentleman uh the thing i admire is like when you see the dedication of what these guys still do like someone like him who still sees practicing playing guitars and the hours that they put into the studios prior to going out on tour and just the fact that he's got the time of day for you and he's asking how your wife and kids are and everything all right and just then telling you stories from way back when you know just brilliant and uh i think the story that you'll love um is the story with, i was in la with um steven gerard and i knew stevie from the england days mm. of looking after him with the euros and the world cups when he was at liverpool so i was in la and um I, we we basically he came to the hotel where i was staying i think i was with with one of the bands and I said, just come around and have dinner. So anyway, sat and have dinner. And who walks in? So Paul and, and his wife. So I look at Stevie and I say, hey, have you ever met Sir Paul? You know, one Liverpool legend to another. Yeah. And he's gone, no, never. He said, that's the one person that I really wanted to meet. And I went, well, let me introduce you. I said, you know, it's, I know these people. And, uh, you know, he said, no, 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 no. Honestly, don't bother. No, 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 no. I'm embarrassed. I said, what are you going to be embarrassed about? So anyway, throughout the whole meal, he sat in the corner over there. So the whole meal, I'm Stevie. I'm like, this, this guy's, and I'm telling you, Steve, he's a gentleman. He'd love to meet you. No, 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 honestly, honestly. Anyway, the meal went on. And the more I thought about it, I said, you know, these opportunities just don't come up in life, really. No. And I said, the coincidences, you know, there's a lot of this cross links and things that happen. And I said to him, so I got up and he's like, no, honestly, Dave, don't, please. Like that. I said, okay. So anyway, I said, right, let me, let me get the bill. He said, no, I'll get the bill. So I just shut up and I literally just walked over. And they hadn't started their meal. I was very respectful of people. And I said, so Paul, um, how are you doing? They said, Glad. Hey, man, you're doing you're great. He said, I said, can I just introduce you to someone? He said, yeah, sure. So I said, this is Stephen Gerrard. So Steve stood there and he's, Steve's gone to shake his hand. He says, stuff the handshake, lad, come here. Gives him, a big, <laughs> gives him a big hug. So the next thing, they're chatting away 10 minutes. I'm talking to Nancy's wife. Yeah. And uh, he was like, great, I nice see you. Thanks. Have a lovely evening. Didn't, sorry to interrupt, you know, blah, blah. He said, not at all, not at all. Like, genuine. As we're walking out, Stevie turns around and says to me, 
do you know what? I've never been so nervous in all my life. I said, I looked at him and I went, you've played in Champions League finals, you've played in FA Cup <laughs> finals, you've done, played in front of all the cop. I said, for wow. years on end as a kid, I said, you play for England in World Cups and Euros? And he went, no, honestly, I was really, really nervous. And I'm glad really that I did it because again, some lovely people that I've just been very fortunate enough to connect with, with what I do yeah. uh, and my, my industry and my business. And um, it was just one of those moments. I just thought, ah, oh, I've, I've got nothing to lose here. I mean, if I was, you know, if he was busy in a conversation and if he, you know, he, he would have politely told me where to go, but I just know that the type of man he is, he's, you know, he, I've got nothing but much love and respect for these people. Cause like I said, to be at the very top for so long, and, you know, recreate yourselves all the way through and the, the journey, you know, is absolutely phenomenal. I mean, I love watching, listening, observing, sponging from these people, you know, in my own career and what I'm doing yeah. and my own businesses. So, yeah, I've, uh, I've been very, very lucky and fortunate and uh, I've just met some incredible people, uh, you know, in the journey and uh, whatever I could do to try and connect to those people that have got mutual respect and obviously... You know, that one from being a Liverpool man yourself, I oh, think yeah. would just be I mean, the opportunity to be too big to, to turn down. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen McCartney right here in San Antonio. He did the Tobin Centre. Um, There's only uh, 1,750 people the whole... But I knew the stage ends and I got in because the tickets yeah. were a minimum of $1,000. Didn't get to meet him. Uh, I was uh, tried so hard, but I didn't get to meet him. But fantastic show, uh, an intimate show. And it's all about live and let die. He actually still had the pyrotechnics indoors, which I was surprised with. He normally does that at stadiums. Right. Well, we had the pyrotechnics indoors for that and the theatre. Wow, yeah. fantastic, fantastic. Like the Alamo all over again, huh? The Alamo all over again. <laughs> <laughs> so next up, you work with you two. I, I, I want to hear the, uh, the, the Larry Mullen story of his ankle. I'm sure every, all the listeners are going to love this one. So uh, just out of the blue, I, I just get asked you know, I come from sport, I'd left the Knicks. Would you ever think about working with bands? And I was like, well, bands, they don't need physios, you know, it's like, you know, so they were like, okay. So I ended up going for an interview, not hearing nothing, not hearing nothing. I think, oh, I probably didn't get the job. And then out of the blue, they said, you know, could you come on tour? So I did one tour, then I did another tour, and then I did another tour. And again, uh, a group of guys who have got like incredibly professional, incredible work ethic. Uh, and again, keeping themselves, recreating themselves and being at the very top. When you see what goes on behind the machine, it's phenomenal. It's absolutely phenomenal. Oh, it's like imagine, the best yeah. of the best. Yeah. Um, and the dedication and time and uh, that all of them put in, and they're obviously all different characters. Um, and they've got a very big families, you know, and they've got a family within the family that have been some of the guys, you know, have been with them. Joe uh, has been with them, I think, for 30 odd years. Um, their tech's the same, you know, they're great, great people and top of their game. Yeah. So uh, it was a Joshua Tree tour and we were playing in Amer in North America and uh, I Larry had a problem with his foot. and I, I taped his foot before the gig. And for some reason, they didn't have sound check. They were supposed to have sound check because I normally would prep, make sure you feel okay with the tape in sound check before you go live. But for whatever reason, something didn't happen and they didn't have sound check. So I taped this ankle. So normally during the show, you know, you have to be undergrounded during the intervals, make sure everything's okay. But all the work really is done in the build up to the, the tour, maintenance during the tour. And then afterwards, I would end up treating them after the tours you know it's quite professional mm. um it's like doing anything in the sports world so i'm on the I, I normally go and have a coffee or i go back in into my room uh near the dressing rooms and i basically would sit and then i would listen to the songs and then i would go backstage when i need to be because you've seen the show so many times so we're in seattle at the, at the uh seattle uh, seahawks ground i think there's like 90 odd thousand right <laughs> So they're in like two or three songs in and I get a call on the radio, Dave to underground ASAP. And I'm thinking, shit, you know, what's, what's happened here. Right. So I'm legging it, get underground. I get to the tech and Larry's tech says to me, the tape's too tight. 
So I'm looking at the song list and I'm like, okay, so there's four more songs, you know, all right, tell him we'll wait, we'll get through the four songs and take it up when he comes down. So Sammy's text come up, it's come back down to me. He says, no, he wants you to take it off now. And I'm like, they're in the middle of the gig. <laughs> I said to, I said, I said, Sam, what do you want me to do? I says, I don't know. You need to go up there. So they're, so they're playing they're in the middle of the song to 90,000 people. So I've obviously got all my, uh, my blacks on, right. Yeah. And I literally commando crawl at the side of Larry's drums. Right. So he's already taking his shoe and sock off and I've got, I've got these big pair of scissors and I'm trying to cut this tape from his ankle and the scissors are big. And I'm now worried that I'm actually going to cut the drummers, you know, kick drum <laughs> foot. <laughs> <laughs> so then I start to try and tear this tape. Right. So you got to remember it, they're in into Bono's talking and they're just about to go there into another song. So I'm under the cosh here. I've, I've got to basically race to get this tape off. So next thing, Larry's kicked me, and I've sort of looked up, and he's gone, next song. And they've gone straight into the next song. you got to wait again. So I'm like, <laughs> where, where do I go? <laughs> so I'm lying down, right, like a commando position, right, on the side of the stage, and obviously it's quite high up. So fortunately, I don't think many people will probably in the gantries will probably see what's this idiot doing down there. So I have to stand there, and then Bono comes over and he's singing, and he's sort of standing on the drums and he's singing, looking at Larry, and he's looked down and seen me, and I'm thinking, oh no, I'm gonna I'm gonna get fired here. <laughs> you know, I've I've proper screwed up here. So then he play, Larry's playing the drums without any shoes and sock on, right? So then they finish that song. So then I'm next. Eventually, I get the tape off, right? And I get underground. And I'm sitting there. I've got two more songs now before intermission. So I'm sitting there thinking, oh, God, I'm going to get it in. I'm going to get in here for. So then as they come in, they obviously see the funny side of it. And they turn around and go, do you want to come and join us up on stage? Do you want to come and do a rendition? <laughs> so I just was like, I'll hold my hands up. I said, yeah, yeah, you know, I screwed up here. You know, sorry. Yeah. But fortunately, fortunately, Larry saw the funny side of it, which yeah. was great. So Brilliant. again, incredible people incredible incredible experiences yeah um sometimes i just have to pinch myself just to like travel around the world and see what these guys do and Bless. see why they are who they are you know legendary yeah. status and i mean you if you'd had the fortunate experiences of seeing that joshua tree tour and that stage and that the visions and the you know all the people behind it that put that show together i mean it is spectacular and uh i've been very very fortunate to uh, be associated with uh, such a, a formidable group and also four incredibly great people like really great people been fortunate enough to go and work with these artists and when you see what they actually what their music actually does and then you hear stories about you know saving people's lives and changing people's lives and mm people that reminisce and link things to music. I think it's just a, it's a phenomenal thing. Um, and I DJed, I was big into sort of, I said the soul and the funk when I was at, uh, at university in Leeds and I used to DJ on a Friday night at a club. So I was always sort of um, into my vinyl and I think I got about 10,000, I still got my vinyl, still got my decks. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I, I really enjoy well, it. Vinyl's, really back enjoy now. It. vinyl's back now, isn't it? Everyone's buying vinyl. Yeah, now. yeah, it's back yeah, now. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So your company now, David, A Therapy. Yeah, so we got clinics in the UK, in London, and New York, and uh, Los Angeles, and uh, I got a really good good group of doctors, chiros, osteopaths, physios, trainers, um, and we've been able to build it and just you know word of mouth really, just work off reputation and uh, yeah, it's a nice. Uh, I got a nice. I, in fact, I had a conversation today with all my team because during COVID we've all been locked down. Um, so uh, hopefully the UK is going to open up soon and the gyms will open up and uh, we'll start getting back to some business but I've got a good group of people that have uh, for me it's all about people it's all about relationships yeah. and yeah. Uh, you know I, I got into this industry to care about people and help people and uh, that's what we try and do as a company really Dave it's been an absolute pleasure mate I want to thank you so much for your time I know you're a very very busy guy and it's been an honour absolute honour thank you so much for joining us Ladies and gentlemen, listeners, Mr. Dave Hancock. Cheers, Dave. Thank you. Pleasure, Joey. Keep smiling.